Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Eric Cox. I'm a member of the Net Capital team. Let's allow one moment for everybody to settle in. Thanks. Dual fisting, you know. <laughs> you got yourself tea and coffee. <laughs> I started with coffee. I worked my way to tea. I just, I was just listening to a podcast and they're saying like, Somewhere around 90% of, uh, of American antioxidants come from coffee and tea, like we're just not good at consuming other antioxidants. Huh. Interesting. That's fascinating. Yeah, I, I was having a sore throat. So um, back from my uh, movie producing days, I got to know Throat Coat, which is a, oh, yeah. a tea that a lot of actors drink to try and loosen up that throat. Oh, interesting. I, I knew it. I knew it as a uh, just as a civilian, but it is good. I think there's an elderberry version of that. Good for oh, nice. fighting off uh, fighting off illness too. Love that. So folks are still <laughs> trickling in, but we can go ahead and get started. So I'm going to do some housekeeping first, and then we'll dig in uh, to the questions. So welcome again today. I'm excited to welcome Andrew Tight with Catch. Um, as always, this company is actively raising capital on the Net Capital platform. I'm going to go ahead and add a link to that into the chat right now. There it is. Um, a few quick housekeeping items. Please do use the Q&A feature built into Zoom. I know there's also a chat function, but Q&A makes it so much easier for me to track the questions as they come in and get to as many of them as possible. And please do ask your questions. Uh, we're here for you, and we want this to be as interactive as possible. Uh, so with all that being said, please join me in welcoming Catch onto the stage. Come on in, Andrew, and tell me tell me a little bit about what you're building here. Yeah. Hey, Eric, thank you so much uh, for having us. Um, so at Catch, we have developed a technology that captures the underlying elements that explain why people like you and I build these kind of emotional bonds with a particular, you know, piece of content, right? So... It, it, realistically, this technology is all based around the catch media genome. So the media genome is similar to the Pandora music genome, uh, as it was created by the same uh, architect, um, our co-founder, Dr. Nolan Gasser. But the media genome basically gets to the core of what makes up a piece of content. We break movies and television episodes into about 25, 2600 unique variables. So everything from plot themes to issues to stylistic approaches to moods. And these aren't like binary tags. It's not like uh, this character is likable, it's on or it's off. It's if this character is likable, to what degree does this affect the overall experience of the story? So if you can imagine all of this, every piece of content broken down into the same variables, all of a sudden, you know, every data scientist on the call is probably like, oh my gosh, that is a rich data set. Um, the, the kind of data and analysis and insights that you can derive from that is just outstanding. So what we're doing is we're leveraging what Pandora kind of made special and kind of what made them ahead of their time into a B2B SaaS-based data and analytics company that offers unique, qualitative, and powerful you know, market insights into audience taste in movies, TV shows, and other pieces of content. No, that, that's very cool, Andrew. And, and you mentioned the, the media genome was built by uh, the team uh, that you brought in from Pandora. We, we have to dig right into your team. Your team's out of control. I don't know where you want to start, but why don't you tell us about the rest of the folks that you're working with? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the, the thing that I'm by far most proud of is our team. Um, I, I, as a movie producer, I'm a movie producer by trade. I was at Lionsgate for a bunch of years. Um, and what I learned as a producer in everything you work on, uh, especially on a movie, it's you need to get the right people on the bus before you start production, because if you don't, you're gonna have a hell of a time. Um, and so the thought was, how do we get the right people on the catch bus, if you will? And so realistically, um, you kind of look at our co-founders. So there, there's four of us uh, in particular. We have me, uh, then Kyle Haley, who is a former Walt Disney Imagineer, Jacob Clifton, who is a data scientist from Universal Studios. Uh, and then most noteworthy on the founding team is Dr. Nolan Gasser, who is one of the founding executives and the chief uh, or the, the architect of the Pandora Music Genome Project. So basically the thing that made Pandora run and exist, that, that was all based off of Nolan's expertise. And so what he did for Pandora was 
created this, you know, analytical way of breaking down music. So if you love this, you know, Led Zeppelin song and this Rolling Stones song, it can identify, you know, what attribute within that piece of music you resonated with. And they make recommendation to a new piece of content, new song that shares similar attributes that you might have never heard of. Maybe you've never even heard of the artist. And then you absolutely love. And so he's taken that and brought it to catch. So on to also on our team, um, my right hand, my COO is a guy named Mitch Lowe. Uh, Mitch was one of the founding executives of Netflix. And after Netflix went on to be one of the founding executives and president and COO of a company called Redbox, which is a pretty big company. He joined when they had, I think their first year, they had $36,000 of revenue. Uh, when he left uh, by year five, they had, I think, $1.5 billion of revenue uh, with $200 million in free cash flow. Uh, and then after that, he every good executive has had a major failure. Uh, his was rather public uh, as the CEO of MoviePass. Um, you know, I loved MoviePass and I think it proved I was a huge user of MoviePass. Uh, and and I, just, I just remember when I was interviewing him, he, you know, one of the perks of having someone like Mitch on the team is he's, when you're doing your due diligence, the people he puts you in touch with to do your reference checks. Like my reference check for Mitch was with Mark Randolph, who was the founder and CEO of Netflix. And I'm just like, I've read this guy's book. Like, how am I on the phone with this dude? Um, but just an absolute legend, just brilliant when it comes to thinking about how technology and discovery and engagement and recommendation all collide together in this entertainment world, right? And then after that, we have, uh, who's actually not on our net capital site, but um, our CMO is a woman named Verena Popic. And Verena, she is about as legendary as they come. Uh, she was, you know, employee number three or four, uh, but basically founding head of marketing for a company called Musical.ly. Uh, for those that know Musical.ly, they ended up turning into a company called TikTok. Uh, and so she grew TikTok to their first, I think, 250 million users um, opening their office in London and all around Europe. Uh, she's two time Forbes 30, and 30 under 30 and was on the cover of the European issue. Also on the team, we have a guy named uh, Dr. Brett Danaher, who's our chief data scientist. And Brett is about uh, the chief uh, digital strategy officer for Sony, uh, gave me a, a nugget where he said that Andrew, Brett will never tell you this, but he, I consider Brett a top three entertainment data scientist in the world. Um, just the way that he thinks about entertainment data, data analytics is unique. Uh, and he actually holds this conference every, every year for all the, you know, it's a very exclusive conference where it's just basically the top data scientists within all of the major entertainment companies uh, come together to have basically a mind meld, a, a nerd, you know, hangout where they just talk about all of the problems that they're running into. Uh, when I interviewed him, he said, Andrew, you know all of the people in the executive suites at all, all around town. So you're gonna go and you're gonna pitch catch and they're gonna love it. But the problem is, is after that meeting, they're gonna leave and they're gonna go down to the data science team and say, does this make sense? And he says, those people, those are my friends. And so it really is just a really great um, uh, collaboration. And I'm, there's others on our team, John Dickinson, who's our head of sales, Arthur Coleman, oh my gosh, he's our chief product officer. He comes from the data world. We needed someone from the data world, right? Uh, we have a lot from the entertainment world and the data science world, but we needed someone from the data sales world. And so John comes from the data sales world and Arthur from a product perspective and his right hand, Ray Krause, um, are just absolute legends. They used to work for a company called Axiom, which if you, Axiom and LiveRamp, if you know anything about data, this is, these are like the creme to the creme of the data companies and selling, you know, audience segments, which is where we are ultimately going into kind of as we cross the chasm, if you will. Um, and I'm sure I'm forgetting someone, so they'll probably slap me later, but you know, that's, that's about, uh, there's our team right there. Well, from what I'm seeing on the offering page, I think you did a very thorough uh, job of covering your team. Uh, I'm glad you added uh, Verena a topic. I think uh, that's an important addition to the team. So it's great to hear about uh, about her as well. For those who aren't super familiar with the space, what is the big problem uh, that Catch is solving? And if you want to weave problem and solution, you can, or you can just focus on problem and then we'll follow up with solution. Yeah, yeah. Let's uh, start with problem. So I... So there's really two problems that we're solving. It's the first one is how can content providers align their products 
with the right audience, right? How do we get, you know, Andrew Tite, producer of Norm of the North, how do I make sure that the audience for Norm of the North actually sees the advertisement for Norm of the North? Because I guarantee you it's not for everyone. It, I do not recommend seeing this movie if you are not between the ages of six and eight years old. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's the market. And so how do you, how does a content provider align, you know, their product with the right audience? That's problem number one. And then I guarantee, or 99% of you have felt problem number two. And problem number two is Friday night, your, or Tuesday, or, you know, Thursday morning, whatever you do for work. I don't know. I'm not going to judge here. You sit on the couch or lay in bed and you open up Netflix and you scroll. And then you scroll and you're like, oh, what should I watch? And then you, I don't know, uh, let me go over to Disney. And then you scroll and then HBO. And it's just like, there's so much content. Like how, how are you going to, to find something to watch? It's, it's, you know, nearly impossible. And then if you factor in, let's say Eric, you and I, we're sitting there and we want to watch a movie together with buds. And it's just like, well, shit, excuse my language. But like, this, you know, we're in a, we're in, we're in trouble right now because now it's my unique taste, your unique taste. There's nothing out there that understands both of us. And so those are the kind of two problems. And this, kind of this two-pronged approach leads to a future where catch can unlock the emotional dimensions between brands and consumer products in the entire consumer market. So for example, you know, what are the visual and narrative elements that define a Mercedes-Benz buyer versus a Land Rover buyer? And then how can these insights inform campaign targeting, creative, et cetera? So that's really kind of uh, where we're going, you know, into the, that's another problem that we'll get to. <laughs> yeah. And so you know, let's dig deeper into this catch media genome and the solutions that you guys are creating over there. So uh, let's start with, I think let's start with your first problem that you mentioned, which was the, the, the targeting the right audiences <laughs> and getting the right, getting in front of the right demographics for the content that you create. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, realistically there, we break kind of the market into three different groups. It's the wholesale, the retail, and the brands and agencies, right? So a wholesale would be any company that is creating or serving content that will be consumed by a retailer. So that includes production companies, uh, production development arm of studios, market research companies. Retail would be any company that does business directly with a consumer, uh, so like a streaming platform, a smart TV or social media platform, right? And then the third is the brand and agencies kind of which I talked about, which is any company that is selling consumer products like a Nike, Honda, Air France, and any company that is, you know, supporting a company selling products like a creative agency. So those are kind of like the three different groups, right? And so for wholesale, we help in green lighting and marketing decisions by helping them understand the emotional dimensionality around their audience, right? And then so for, for retailers, we help increase viewership and subscription retention um, through kind of uh, emotionally informed marketing, if you will, uh, and enhanced UX around discovery and recommendation. So a good, a good way to think about this. So Netflix, Netflix has the best data in the world. Netflix doesn't give their data to anybody. Lionsgate made orange is the new black yet you know, we didn't get any information about Orange is the New Black. We don't know what were the most popular episodes. We don't know what characters people resonated with. That we don't know when people stopped watching, when people started watching, how many, how long it took them to stream the entire episode, where where based, you know, globally these people were that resonated with this. And so the way that people rely on getting data is, and I I actually promise you this is the case you read reviews on YouTube. So if you actually want, or Rotten Tomatoes, so if you want to talk to the creatives on a, for a Netflix show, write a review, because I guarantee you that is where we go to find any kind of intrinsic understanding of how people are feeling. I was talking to a buddy of mine that produces the show Dollface. And I was like, dude, you have a direct deal with Netflix. You know, do you, what kind of data do you have? Uh, and he was like, we don't, we don't have anything. And I was like, all right, well, you did Dollface for, for, for Hulu. So what kind of data do you get from them? He goes, literally, Andrew, we get nothing. I am reading the YouTube reviews to figure out which characters we should include more in the next season. And I'm like, that is the most ridiculous concept. 
and so everyone assumes. So let's just focus on the fact that Netflix has this incredible amount of data, right? They have, you know, bazilla bytes or whatever you call it of data. And, you know, there's this concept, there's this, I think, misconception that Netflix uses their data to say, we should kill off this character. We should, you know, green light this movie. But if we green light this movie, let's change the plot to make it blah, 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 blah. Yeah, they use a data for a little bit of that, but not as much as people might think. Where Netflix uses their data is they understand if they're gonna recommend, you know, the Queen's Gambit to Eric and to Andrew, what poster of the Queen's Gambit should I show Eric versus showing Andrew? What trailer should I show Eric versus Andrew? What clip should I show Eric versus Andrew? And so on on this one-to-one -one scale across their entire ecosystem. And that is the power that Netflix has. And so from a retailer standpoint, if Catch has a deep understanding of content, a deep understanding of user and user behavior by partnering with a streaming service that might not have the Netflix kind of skill set, then all of a sudden Catch can understand what trailer of this, co of this content is best for Eric versus Andrew, what poster is best for Eric versus Andrew, because we're both gonna love the Queen's Gambit, but the reason you know Eric's gonna like it is because of the the really unique use of special effects and visual effects with the way that the the checkers I mean, the the chess pieces move on the ceiling. And for Andrew, you know, I like it because I'm a huge sports fan, and realistically, this has the same makeup, themology of thematic elements of a sports story, and so how do we make sure to show the right trailer to get us both to engage and consume that, that content, right? So that's, I don't know if that answered your question. It was kind of black, but. Uh, I think that was so, I'm so informative and, and please feel free to continue to do that. I think that's what people really appreciate about this discussion. Um, and one of the favorite things about Queen's Gambit, of course, flawed protagonists. Love Dude. a good flawed protagonist, just like the boys, et cetera. Well, you, you know, it. it's the, we, we call that the tale of the flawed hero, right? And, and I think that that is, those are the kinds of elements, you know, that case in point. So um, my, through the genome, right? I learned that it's fascinating. I, I was a movie producer for years. I, you know, was in deeply, deeply involved in this industry. And yet I was so ignorant to the elements that make me like what I like, right? What are, what are, you know, what are those things that turn me away from content at, that, that can be super simple? And what are the things that really attract me to content? Um, my my uh, old roommate in LA, he's a screenwriter. He, we used to call it before the genome, our blind spot. What is our blind spot? And he said, my blind spot where I will ignore all plot holes and really anything is a well-dressed spy. You know, if it's a well-dressed spy, you know, I'm willing to forego anything else just because I just like the environment. And for me, it's an underdog story where it's, you know, has to do with music and happy ending. You know, if that's, you know, I'm willing to watch a Hallmark movie that has that story to, you know, uh, a faith-based movie that has that story to, you know, something else. Um, and, you know, I just don't even care. But what I found in the genome, which is fascinating, is that I don't like Parasite, I, well, I, I, it's, I appreciated it, I, but I didn't enjoy it. I didn't like Parasite and Tiger King for the exact same reason. Okay, I'm sure there are some film people on here that are pissed um, because Parasite is a Academy Award winning film. It is a brilliant piece of filmmaking. Tiger King is a Netflix original reality show that is polarizing um, to say the least. Um, but if you actually look at those two pieces of content, they both have unlikable, unethical main characters. And I have a really, really, really hard time resonating with unlikable, unethical main characters. Shit, I just watched The White Lotus and another great critically acclaimed show that, you know, would I watch it again? Heck no, not a chance because it's unlikable, unethical main characters, and it just really doesn't make me feel good. And so if you can actually get to the core of those kind of elements, some people, that is as simple as, as simple as a stylistic cinematographic approach 
where you don't realize that you love handheld cameras with dramatic uses of color that have, you know, gritty reality with a, you know, a smart and poetic script. You might not know that, right? Because it's not your job to know that. You're the, you're the audience. Your, your job is to sit down on the couch and escape, right? That's what Hollywood's all about. It's about, you know, how do we give these people a chance to escape, escape into this world, think about something new. One thing, another thing that I love about media, and I'm just going here, sorry, um, is the ability of media to change the world, right? So media, I think we can all agree, has is one of the single kind of most impactful things in the world for the good and for the bad, right? You know, fake news has huge implications around the world, right? Um, if you only perceive something in one way, guess what? You're gonna see it that way. You see this with racism, you see this with sexism, you see this with everything in all these. I, I was in a conversation with um, this, uh, this woman in Africa um, and she's the queen of this uh, tribe of people in the Congo. And what she was talking about is how all of her people wanna come to the United States. And we were talking, trying to get to the core of the reason why, right? And the reason that she was talking about that is because all of the content that she was, that they were seeing portrayed the U.S. in such a wonderful light. And when you think about the portrayal of her country and her continent, you think of it either in, you know, a safari to Africa or Hotel Rwanda and, you know, Blood Diamond. And so she was like, Andrew, imagine if the only content that people were exposed to was content that showed, you know, another school shooting, another race riot, another, you know, you know, political unrest. If that was the only content that was portrayed, you know, those people in her tribe in Africa would have no interest in coming to the United States. And so it's what's what's great about content, it gives it with a genomic approach. If we were to act, because that content exists, that content exists in Africa. And it exists in India and it exists all around the world. So if you can genomically analyze all of this content, then you can start to draw these parallels between the piece of content from, from the Congo and, you know, Andrew that loves, you know, a, a underdog story about a musician, because I'm sure that that story exists out there. And so how do you draw those parallels? Um, and so one, one, one last thing I'll just say about the power of media is, if you actually look at, do you remember the movie The Day After Tomorrow? It, it was I do. That, yeah, awesome film, right? After that film came out, there was a there was climate change reform passed in New Zealand. That movie had was totally made up. It was a fun fictional, you know, Hollywood film. But climate change reform was passed because of it, because it had the themes of climate change baked into its you know, narrative. And so it wasn't a punch in the face, but it made you think. You remember that, you know, kind of multi-billion dollar film called Avatar? After Avatar came out, guess what? More money was donated at the time to stop deforestation in the Amazon than, than ever before. That was a movie that took place on a made up planet called Pandora, go Pandora, um, but called Pandora with, you know, blue people and, you know, but it was made up, but it had themes of deforestation and it found a way to communicate that to an audience around the world. And so that just shows the power of media, right? So I went on total tangent, so sorry. <laughs> no, no, I, no, it, it, is, it is incredibly powerful. And I think getting, getting the right content in front of the right people is really powerful. And that's what you're, what you're doing with Catch. And I know, and before I get to the halfway mark and I'll start doing a little bit more housekeeping, I do want to circle back to that other problem that we all have, which is that 20 minute scroll. I think, uh, you know, I think another uh, company told me about this issue. Of, I think somewhere on average, dozens of minutes are spent trying to determine of the you know, millions of hours, I don't know, hundreds of thousands, millions of hours of content that are available, what, where do you go to? And, and I think a lot of people default to things they've already seen just to get past making those decisions. So can you talk a little bit about um, how Catch is solving that problem? Yeah, absolutely. So we're working with, so we're, we're, we call it B2B to C, right? So we're working with streaming platforms 
Um, so big streaming platforms, medium streaming platforms uh, to help them improve their own ability to engage, extend users on a platform. So the way that recommendation is done is at something called collaborative filtering. Collaborative filtering is basically, you know, person A, you know, Eric watched A and B, Andrew watched A, so, you know, Andrew probably should also watch B. And what happens with a system like that, it, it falls into, you know, these broad-based genre kind of echo chambers, if you will. And that's not that helpful. We're so much more than, you know, there's such a huge difference between, you know, a Michael Bay action film and a Steven Spielberg action film, but they're both action, you know, they're both war. Um, and so it, 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 with, with a genomic approach where you can actually get to the core reasons behind why we like what we like, you can start to make some really, really interesting um, uh, connections to actually hopefully guide people to content that they actually love. But also it's this idea of content discovery, right? So right now you can't go on to Netflix or you can't go on to uh, HBO Max. I think Netflix, you can maybe do this now, um, but you can't go on to HBO Max and say, I'm looking for an underdog story that is a sports story that has a happy ending and is a biopic. You can't do that. But you know, in my genomic search engine, I can literally type that in and it will pop up things like you know, Rudy, Eddie the Eagle, um, and the only reason I know this is because I've looked, I've done this search, uh, Eddie the Eagle. Um, oh, but I, I discovered this new one on Netflix called The Long Shot or Long Shot, which I never, it's not The Long Shot with, you know, Seth Rogen, which is this movie about, you know, pol politics, et cetera, but it's a documentary about a guy that gets arrested for a murder he didn't commit. And basically his alibi is he was at the Dodger game. Right. And I'm going to spoil, even though I, I, I I'm not going to, I'm not going to spoil, spoil it. This is all, it was big news, but realistically what ended up happening is they were shooting an episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm at the Dodger game that day. And that was one thing he kind of slightly remembered from months and months and months earlier. And it basically is a story of trying to find that footage in the B roll at the Dodger game that can free this guy from the murder charges where the person's pursuing the death, death penalty, which I never would have found that. I didn't know anything about this movie, but guess what? Found that film in a genomic style of search and discovery. And so those are the kinds of enhancements, right? And so if you're working with a company where let's say I just binged um, you know, Game of Thrones, right? So I just finished Game of Thrones. You enter into this kind of, what do I watch next, right? And so if you can work with them to help understand what is Eric's taste profile here? What are the genomic elements that resonate with Eric? So that when I'm trying to engage and keep Eric on this platform post finishing Game of Thrones or post watching, you know, I don't know, the White Lotus or whatever, what can we show Eric to try and get him to continue watching that? And, but then give this explainability. I don't know how many of you used Netflix, I mean, used uh, Pandora um, uh, pretty regularly, but one thing that was great about Pandora that only they were able to do was explain why. It was, hey, Eric, we're recommending this new song to you because we've noticed that you resonate with this type of harmony, this type of instrumentation, this type of whatever that's in this song that we're recommending to you. And so if we can say, hey, Eric, we're recommending, you know, about time to you because it has strong father-son relationship. It has, you know, a, a, an intimate piano-based score. You know, all of a sudden you're like, oh shit, you know, I do like that. I do like that. And so then you become an active viewer, right? Versus this algorithmic me mechanical data dump of you've seen this film. So we're going to throw a ton of movies at you. You know, that, even if all of them are great, that doesn't help, right? You know, I think that's super interesting about the idea of learning more about ourselves 
from sharing the data with the consumer. I mean, I remember, you know, you know, early stage, the idea was you find a movie critic that that liked movies that you also enjoyed, and then you and then you could follow that critic along and, and go, right. you know, that better better than Rotten Tomatoes, et cetera. But the idea that well, you, you know, so have... I was talking with um, Patrick Lee, the founder of Rotten Tomatoes. He was one of our guest speakers at Catch University, and what was so interesting is he said if you know, first he said we sold way too early because they sold real fast. Um, and, but he said the thing that he would have, if he could have done anything different, it would have added, cause he, you know, he's the first to tell you, you know, Rotten Tomato is, you know, it's, it's not directed at you. It's very broad, but what they really wanted to do was figure out, you know, Eric, who are the, you know, 20 critics that you share similar taste profiles with, right? And then it can be a different, Rotten Tomato score for Eric versus for Andrew, right? Because, you know, why am I going to listen to this Rotten Tomato score? Because everyone says this is a 69% or, a, you know, a 26%. Shoot, I love that movie. Why is it a 26%? You know? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. That's really cool that uh, the reasoning behind it being shared with the people that are creating that data. I think that's, that's really powerful. And I'm I'm going to take this moment because we're a little over halfway here because we're just having a great time. So I want to remind everybody, though, you can go directly to netcapital.com and search catch or go directly to the link that I added into the chat, which is netcapital.com slash companies slash catch. That's catch with a K. We'll go ahead and copy and paste that into the chat one more time in case we missed it earlier. There it is. Um, or you can go read the offering page, learn more about the team and the solutions, the products they're providing. Uh, as well as invest if you're so inclined to do so. So I do want to remind everybody about that. Um, circling back now, though, you know, there are a couple of topics I think we should really cover uh, from an investment standpoint. I think the, the first part where we should go uh, is the revenue model. You mentioned B2B2C. I know there's also other elements to it. Can you talk a little bit about how cash makes money? Yeah, absolutely. So kind of as I talked about earlier with the wholesale retail agency play. So the wholesale was to help with green lighting and marketing to connect that emotional dimension to audiences. The retail was kind of to help increase viewership, subscription retention, um, you know, by enhancing the UX of discovery and recommendation. And then for the, the broader kind of agency brand play, it's, you know, bridging the gap between how brands talk to their customers and how audiences, you know, why audiences love content, et cetera. Um, and so in terms of our go-to-market strategy, so for, you know, for, from a purely product perspective, um, our genomic and metadata offering utilizes a SaaS-based uh, annual subscription depending on scope and application. Um, but we're actually pre-product from an analytical analytics platform perspective. So much of our early revenue is being driven by custom projects uh, that make use of our technical uh, technological proposition. Um, and so we're building those around a long-term product integration kind of depending on the use case. Um, but we're also, you know, in the process of continuing to build our Catch Data Cloud, which is a platform that allows users to safely bring their data onto our system uh, for enhancements and analytics. Uh, this is a modular SaaS platform that we are currently expanding on. Um, and then as I've kind of alluded to this entire time, we're going to cross the chasm into this ad marketing in mid-2022. Um, so this includes, you know, audience products, which is where, you know, Arthur, our chief product officer and Ray Krause, our VP of product are very, very intimately, you know, involved. Um, and so these audience products can be incorporated, incorporated into like media buying or direct targeting, um, in, in addition to kind of campaign strategy and positioning, um, uh, analytics kind of via this SaaS modular platform, if you will. Yeah, so integrating the consulting piece, um, the the strategy component into the ultimate uh, ad buys uh, attention, uh, you know, attention economy piece as well. Exactly. You know, the the thing that everyone needs to understand if they don't, uh, Hollywood is a network based industry. Um, you know, your net as uh, as Andy Horowitz, who is the head of Atlas Entertainment, which did like Dark Knight, to the new Suicide Squad that just came out, um, American Hustle, etc. What he said is your network is your currency. In Hollywood, with no network, you're essentially poor in this industry. And so, you know, hence why I put together the team that we put together 
because, you know, it is all about having those people want to work with their friends. You know, this is, it's Hollywood, it's entertainment, it's, you know, buddies. Um, and so in that system, it's a lot of, hey, you know, what can we do together here now? And then you build that out and you work together. So it's a little bit different from the traditional, you know, model of business, right? Where you go in and you initially do that and these like pilot projects, if you will. Um, and then they just get addicted and fall in love. And then it's, you know, scale up and expand and grow. And that's kind of what we're seeing right now. Yeah, there's actually one more part that I think is really interesting about how the data-driven analysis will help consumers at the end, ultimately. And I think the part was, I remember talking to some executives in Hollywood and, and they just are unwilling to create content that doesn't have a built-in sequel or trilogy. There's just too much energy and cost into creating the digital asset to not be able to turn around and duplicate that and, and, and triple that. And I think something that'll be interesting here is if the data suggests that we want something, you know, regardless of if it has something super built in, in terms of re repeatable, scalable duplicates, you know, something that you could duplicate easily, maybe you still do it because the data tells you should do it. I think well, that, it, that could be great for a project. You know, Eric, you are really tapping into one of the core things that makes me tick um, and really, and, you know, drives everything that we're doing, you know, decisions about green lighting content is a mitigation of risk. How do we mitigate as much risk as possible? How do you mitigate risk? Based on IP, it's a sequel, you know, throw big stars in it, right? Um, you know, those are the ways to try and mitigate risk. And so if you actually just listen to what I just said, all of that is what you would call metadata, cast, crew, existing IP, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Previous box office results for similar movies like this, right? You know, that's how you mitigate risk because there's no other way of viewing it. But with a genomic approach, all of a sudden, you have this way of mitigating risk via a genomic understanding of the content. One of the first products that we built is a tool called our media indexing tool, which is honestly one of the most rad things I've ever seen in my entire life. And I, and I know I'm biased here, but not really. You know, I'm just speaking as a producer. Um, and so the thing that made the media indexing tool so cool, this is something that is the brainchild of our chief data scientist. It's something that he did something similar with BBC back in the day um, with a much, 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 much shittier genome. Uh, and so now with like sexy data, he makes it a lot cooler. But basically what you're able to do is take the genomic understanding analysis of a piece of content. And then based off of that genomic understanding, you can determine where, where this piece of content will over-index or under-index, over-resonate or under-resonate, and based off of whatever other input variable you have. So we base the initial model off of international box office and all this other stuff. So you can say, based off of the genomic makeup of Knives Out, we can say that it will over-index in Israel and under-index in South Korea. And why? Get that? The why. What is the element here? So when you think about knives out over indexing in Israel, you can say, oh, well, the reason it's over indexing in Israel is because family problems, lots of arguments, an American story, um, family eccentricity, and a few other genomic elements. And then the same thing goes for why does it under index in South Korea? Well, you know, story of work and money, family problems, lots of arguments, uh, family eccentricity. And so that is really, really important because it doesn't mean it's gonna not do well. It, like that's not what over under index means. If, if you make a bad movie, it's a bad movie everywhere. And so what audience will most resonate with this bad film? You're probably still gonna lose some money because you should make a better film. But if you make a great film, it's gonna do great everywhere. But there are some territories where be based off its genomic makeup, it will resonate more with that audience, right? And so what's so cool about that is you can do that at a script stage. And so you can say, you know, based off of this script, we know that this will over index in these territories you're trying to, to trying to target. It doesn't need to be based on an existing IP. There is an audience for this. And if you can ultimately, you know, find who that audience is on a platform and then know how to message that. 
like a great example with the uh, the Knives Out example is, I don't know if you've seen that film, which I love that film, but if you think about the trailer, the international trailer, there's this scene where in this trailer, the uh, Chris Evans character basically is looking at camera and looking at his family and he's like, you suck, you suck, you're the worst kind of human. You know, you laugh, I laugh, it's funny, but it's also highlighting you know, family problems, lots of arguments, et cetera. Why in the heck would you market that to an audience that doesn't resonate with family problems and lots of arguments? You know, you don't need, if you pull that one scene out of that trailer, guess what? There's probably some, uh, you, you probably will find that it resonates and finds an audience. Because when you watch a trailer, you're looking for one thing. And that thing is, why shouldn't I see this film? Because my, 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 my time is money. That's the most valuable asset I have. So why shouldn't I watch this? Um, yeah. No, I think that's, you know, I think that's really, that's a, that is a fascinating approach to marketing content. And I think it reminds me of kind of like the traditional, you know, if a tree falls in the woods and no one's there to hear it kind of thing is you could have phenomenal content or even just mediocre content, but if it doesn't get in front of the right people that it resonates with, then it's, then, then did it even really happen? I think that's, I think that's one thing that that parasite really kind of brought to people's minds was, I think that, you know, right, he specifically said it's just that that, that three inch bar on the bottom of the screen is keeping us from getting engaging with some of the best content ever created. And I think that was really eye opening for a lot of folks. And, um, and then the other piece I think that's really resonating with me from an investor standpoint is what you're really building out here is an opportunity for scrappy startups in the terms of like really small film projects to have like, kind of like a Bloomberg terminal slash Morningstar rating that they could take to to, to producers like yourself to get these films financed. Maybe I don't have the A-list role that de-risks in the way that you want, but here's the data that suggests that even if we don't blow it away in the U.S., here's the internet. <laughs> and, and here's the thing is, and for those what that are on the call that understand film, right? It is how do you, um, a lot of the ways you finance films, right? Is from foreign sales and you know pre-sales, if you will. One of the first films I ever did, I was mentioning to you, Eric, on the call, uh, we sold all of our foreign rights before we did the film. And, you know, with tax incentives as well, we were in the black before we shot our first scene, which is awesome. You know, it's nice knowing that you're not going to lose money before you start shooting. And so if you can take a genomic approach in this indexing tool and, you know, argue for that my film's going to over index in your territory, if I can do that, and I know that prior to shooting, you know, you might be able to get an extra $25,000, $50,000 for that territory. And that might sound small to you, but that adds up. You know, there are a lot of territories out there that you can sell these rights to. And so, you know, that's what Brett did with BBC. They were able to, you know, if they knew that Sherlock over-indexed in Germany, when they're selling the rights to Sherlock to Channel 4 Germany, they're going to ask for more money. And they're probably going to get it because they have data. They have proof that it over-indexes. And if you can provide that proof to a independent producer, to a to this, a sales agent, to even someone on the other side of the coin, right? Buying. I am Andrew for Channel Four Germany. It's my job to buy all of this content. What content is going to resonate with my audience right now? Let's see. But if you had something that said, "Well, you know, I think of all of these pieces of content in the same caliber," because if I have the chance to get Avengers Endgame for a reasonable price, I'm going to get Endgame because that's better than I don't care any film. Um, but if if it's all in the same caliber, which one over indexes with my audience and how do I market this to my audience to convince them to watch it, right? Yeah, it seems like an incredible opportunity for for just like kind of everybody, large scale, large scale productions, but really excited for small scale production. Just getting them a chance oh, to get too, a foot man. in the door. That's, that's, that's awesome. Um, we should definitely talk about market size and the growth of streaming over time. Um, what, for those who are unfamiliar, what does the market for something like this look like? How is streaming growing? I imagine the pandemic only helped. Why don't you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So we kind of look at this at about an $8.5 billion TAM. As you know, TAMs are, you know, calculations and pull this string there, that string there, and we'll see what happens. But as you know, the streaming industry is... Um, blowing up is, is the kind of the nice way to put it. Um, the pandemic was, you know, obviously it's horrible for the world and everything, but it's this, you know, it's pretty incredible what it did to the industry. 
um, it fast tracked all of our projections about where we thought the industry was going. You know, you, you know, think about every new streaming platform launched, right? We have, you know, let's just name a few of the, the top of mind, you know, Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, Disney, HBO, Peacock, Discovery Plus, Paramount Plus, Stars, Showtime, uh, Acorn, Sundance. I'm sure I'm missing, a, you know, about 200 of them. Um, and they're growing so fast. But here is the underlying problem period exclamation point. The average American's willing to spend about $35 a month on streaming. Okay, whoa, 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 35 bucks a month. I just named, you know, probably $150, $200 a month worth of streaming. So how, am, how are you going to find a user, right? How are you going to find someone that's willing to pay for this? And so, you know, what do you do? You greenlight a hell of a lot of content and try and get someone to land. It's the Handmaid's Tale, right? It's that's what got people onto Hulu was Handmaid's Tale. What got people onto Netflix? It was, you know, Orange is the New Black and um, that Kevin Spacey show. Um, um, House of Cards. House of Cards, okay. thank you. Um, but those are the things. And so, and okay, we have, uh, we have the biggest budget TV show of all time coming out in Lord of the Rings. We have, the Godfather series that's going to be launched uh, with Francis Ford Coppola and Paramount Plus. We have, you know, so many other huge investments, billions of dollars. You know, Netflix is spending about $16 billion a year producing content, $16 billion a year producing content with the hopes of retaining an audience, finding those eyeballs, right? And so how does someone survive? And the way they survive is by creating personalization. Personalization is the key to retention in the streaming world, right? And so personalization is understanding Eric and understanding, hey, Eric, I'm not a robot here. I actually genuinely, truly understand your taste and really think that my library has some sweet, you know, stuff for you. And so then you look at, and so, but that's why there have these been these huge acquisitions, you know, eight point whatever billion for MGM, you know, Lionsgate's going to be acquired sometime soon, probably, you know, all of these other ones, any, anyone that has a library is getting picked off left, right, sideways, trying to create this hub of content that people are willing to spend and pay for. And so it's this absolute war right now. And I, just trying to survive. And there will be winners, there will be losers, but I think what's going to ultimately happen, we're going to have a lot of streaming services that will turn into AVOD platforms. So advertising-based video on demand. So kind of like TV shows back in the day with commercials, <laughs> um, but you know, it's going to happen. But now, so now imagine, this is where catch can really be sick. So if it's an advertising based video on demand, every stream that someone has is more money, right? Because, you know, our, it's, it's, I get paid by the advertisers for seeing the show, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So if you can get them to start watching the show and through that first commercial, that's great. And then if I understand Eric's taste and I understand, you know, the taste profile of stuff that you resonate with, and then I understand there are all these different advertisements for, you know, Mercedes, Nike, whatever that, or Patagonia that'll resonate with, with Eric, then maybe I can throw an advertisement in there that resonate with, resonates with Eric so it doesn't feel as disruptive because, you know, I don't have a baby. So why are you advertising me this, you know, car seat? But I do, you know, love backpacking. So you just showed me some sick footage of backpack and then threw a Patagonia logo on the end. I'm going to watch that commercial, you know, nine times out of 10. And so if you can then ultimately grow that, the, the growth of revenue right there, that is measurable, that is scalable, that is something that Catch can really, really help with. Um, and so as you guys are wildly aware, it's only going to get worse, y'all. No, nope, I'm sorry. Um, it's going to be stressful. These next, you know, stressful with content and what do you watch? That's going to be, that's going to continue to be a, a problem. The industry is growing. More money is being poured into it than ever before. More content than ever is being made, you know, you know, I can name tons of companies that are spending over a billion dollars a year on content, um, you know, we're, and we're in talks with all of them. Um, so, because that's a, that's a big risk. If you spend a billion dollars and you don't make more than a billion dollars, that's loss and that's not good.
<laughs> that is not good, Andrew. That is not good. Um, I'm going to give you a heads up because we're getting close to the end, everybody. But I am going to, as we get closer, uh, the final question is going to be a closing remarks. I'm old school. And so I'm going to give you a chance to say why now is the perfect time to go to netcapital.com and invest in cash. So I'm giving you a heads up there. That's a little oh, bit gosh. of a spoiler. Yep, yep. <laughs> Yep, yep. So I know, rack your brain on that. I know you got some some ideas in mind already. But before we get there, there was a there was a really interesting data point on your market section for your offering page, talking about that 10 million mark with regards to barriers that undermine equity and content development and financing. And then I think it was actually from McKinsey, right? Yeah, McKinsey, yeah. when you know, they just argued the greatest consulting. Yeah, arguably the greatest consulting company <laughs> in the world. So. Can you talk a little bit about what McKinsey came to there with that 10 billion that could be unlocked and how that 7% expansion could be really impactful in the space. Yeah. Well, you know, decisions are made by mitigation of risk. What has been made in the past? So do you remember that movie, Crazy Rich Asians? Yep, absolutely. Dope movie. Love that film. Personally, that, if you want to know my taste profile, <laughs> case in point. Did you know that movie was a hard movie to greenlight? Imagine. <laughs> yeah. And so why is it a hard movie to greenlight? Well, uh, it shouldn't be. It's uh, based off existing IP, based on a book. Um, it is, you know, aesthetically rich and gorgeous. It is the story of the wealthy class. It is a rags, you know, kind of a, a rags to riches underdog story. It has, you know, love elements. It's the, you know, will they, won't they. It is, you know, all of these thematic elements that are huge successes that win. But it's an all Asian cast. Mm. Oh, an all Asian cast in an American film market. It's kind of a big budget. I don't know if this will be successful. I don't know if this will be successful because it has never been done before or it's, if done, it hasn't been done to this kind of scope. So when you rely on metadata, you, it makes stuff like that really, really, really hard to green light. And that is bad. Um, and so what you're, what we're hoping for is that with, with this McKinsey study, it really taps into that, um, you know, how much money is being left on the table, um, because the, there are underserved markets that are not seeing themselves represented on screen. They're not, that are not seeing this, um, not really, you know, being addressed, you know, black freaking Panther y'all like, uh, if there's not a big enough sign, you know, to kick you in the face, there's clearly a market, right? Um, and so that those are the kinds of things that we're really, really focusing on. And this is this is case in point, you know, what we're doing with why if you think about the genomic approach and about how in another great example, parasite, y'all, right? This international content that, you know, before streaming, there's not a chance we would have seen it. Um, because it's foreign, they speak, they, they're, they speak a funny language. We don't, you know, it, you know, I have to read, I'm not doing homework while going to the movie theater. Right. Um, but like, that's just, that was the mindset. Right. But in this new era, you're able to cross these cultural boundaries, open our eyes up to different types of content that people resonate with money heist, Lupin, you know, um, I'm sure I'm missing a ton. Everyone has their own favorite, you know, foreign piece of content. Lunchbox, a, a movie that totally fits my taste profile. That's an Indian film that I never in a million years would have found. But if you can break everything into the same language with the genome, think of it kind of like the 26 letters of the alphabet. If every single piece of content can be broken into the same letters, then you can draw these parallels, draw these correlations, draw these connections across cultural boundaries and make the world one world rather than, you know, you know, the United States of America, where we wear, you know, rose colored glasses shaped like the US, right? Where having to talk to a foreign, you know, sale, you know, someone in the production uh, department and convince them that the taste profile of, you know, you know, Bordeaux is different than Hollywood or that, you know, the, it, why doesn't Star Wars work in Latin America? Who knows? Well, I'm sure we can get to the genomic reasons, but 
you know, every time it comes out in Latin America, trying to figure out how can we make, how can we crack Latin America? But there are just elements that don't resonate with the Latin American market. And, you know, that just happens. And so the thing is, is with a genomic approach, you can understand and, and bridge these gaps and find these markets, right? If we only make decisions based off of broad-based metadata, broad-based genres, we will miss so much opportunity. And I think that's what the McKinsey article is talking about. And I think that's where, you know, Catch can really tap into this missed market uh, and, and help greenlight that content because we need to see it, y'all. You know, you know, we're, you know, our number one core value is kindness and our last core value is change the world. Um, and I really believe that we can do that with media. Um, and the genomic approach is honestly no better way to do it. I think that's a really refreshing take on Hollywood, a uh, really refreshing take on access uh, in terms of content and content creation and consumption. Um, last minute here, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Andrew, why is now the perfect time to go to netcapital.com slash companies slash catch uh, or go to netcapital.com and search catch with a K and invest in your company? You know, honestly, there's... I could, you know, spew off a ton of great reasons why now is a great time to go to netcapital.com slash companies slash catch. But realistically, there's there's a billion different reasons, y'all. Um, I think a really good reason is because we're really making a difference. Um, we are changing the industry for the better, in my opinion. If you like film, you know, why not? If you've ever, if how about this? Don't invest in catch. Don't invest in catch unless you've felt the problem of sitting on your couch and looking at that screen and wondering what to watch. And, but, but if you have felt that problem, you're never allowed to get angry about that problem again if you don't invest in catch, because we are solving that problem. Uh, we are solving that problem for you. We're solving that problem for you and your boyfriend, girlfriend, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, whomever you're with, right? And you know, if you've ever felt like you are underrepresented on screen, if you've ever felt that way, invest in catch because we are making a difference in this industry. We are taking this problem on firsthand and I'm happy to talk to anyone offline. Don't ever hesitate to reach out. My email is andrew at k-a-t-c-h-d-a-t-a catchdata.com. Reach out, honestly, send me a LinkedIn request. We'll hang out. We'll talk about movies. I love them. But thank you so I much. Go was... invest in us, y'all. <laughs> Perfect way to conclude, Andrew. It was a pleasure hanging out with you. Thank you so much for our attendees for joining in. Thank you so much for the great questions that came through. I appreciate the love on my moderating. I appreciate that. Um, and I definitely want to also thank our panelists, Andrew Tight, and the whole team behind you at CATS. I know this is never a singular effort, yeah, right. or almost never. Um, and, and based on your team, I know that's the case for you. So thank you for everybody for joining in. It was a pleasure having you. And please do join us next time. I will also, excuse me, of course, I should do my final piece. I got all excited because somebody gave me a compliment. Let me go ahead and, oh, as always, this has been recorded. Here is a link to the YouTube channel uh, that I've added to the chat function. Um, so please feel free to go back, watch anything that you might have missed, share it generously with your friends and family that you think might be interested. Um, and so uh, with all that being said, thanks for joining again, Andrew. I'll see you soon. Yeah, later, Eric. Thank you so much. Be well, y'all. Have a good one. Be great. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, bye.